the thing that I struggle with the most about having gone through conversion therapy is that I blame myself. No one forced me to do conversion therapy. My parents don't even know that it happened to me. But I was part of an institution that conditioned me to believe that there was something wrong with me and that I needed to be fixed. So in believing that, I did what I thought was right at the time. In partnership with Unlikely Collaborators, we've designed Perception Box Questions for communities with shared experiences aimed to broaden self-acceptance and deepen self-understanding. This group of people was all asked, who or what have you left behind on your journey to become who you are today? These are their answers. I am bisexual, but sometimes feel like a fraud since I've only had relationships with heterosexual men. If this is your secret and you'd like to step forward and share your story, you can do so on three. One, two, three. I have had two boyfriends in the past, and I did a little bit of dating on apps in between, and it's only ever been men. I did, like, enter in as, uh, onto, like, Bumble as, uh, like, preference of men and women, but for whatever reason, it just, like, I never, like, actually, like, matched with girls or, like, got to go on dates with girls. I know myself, and I know who I'm attracted to. I think growing up, I grew up really religious and um, my uh, experience even getting like the sex talk was like from the church, um, abstinence-based. Uh, they didn't even talk about uh, different sexualities. Once I was able to like have autonomy over my life and like understand more about how other people are living their truth and meet other people who are bisexual and be like, oh my gosh, me too. Totally. I came to embrace it. I love my partner. We're in a really good relationship going on three years. And I still want to be able to celebrate my sexuality and live my truth. I actually was really nervous to come to this because I'm not out to a lot of my family or friends. Even if it's not directly to anybody, I'm out. Woohoo! <laughs> If you can relate to this in any way, you can step forward on three. One, two, three. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I consider myself asexual panromantic, um, but I've only ever dated women. And sometimes I really do get the feeling of like, oh my gosh, would I actually want to date a guy? Because all of the times I've come close to dating a guy, um, well, for the most part, they ended up being trans women. <laughs> um, but also I've really a lot of the times had that question of, am I actually gonna like this? Is mm -hmm. this actually like something that I am? And it, it, can be, it can be really scary and hard to figure yourself out. I grew up really religious too. Mm -hmm. And so I dated men for most of, all the way up until my 20s. And then I started like trying out women, but like I still identified as bi, but people would poke at it and be like, you've never done anything with women, so you don't know. Exactly. And now I'm on the flip side and I like date mostly women. And so now they're poking at the men and they're like, you don't even like men like that now. <laughs> so I'm like, you just can't win with it. So as long as you know what you are, like just stick to what you know. Cause like, don't, don't listen to everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Like if you know you're bi, you're bi. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. awesome. Can I get a hug? Yeah. Oh, Yay! That's so sweet, of course. Thank you. <laughs> I was put through conversion therapy. When I was 15, um, a really good friend of mine invited me to her church youth group and I went and I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the people that I met and the music and what I believed to be God that I just immersed myself in this religious belief system and voluntarily started going to church every Sunday by myself. And then when I was uh, 17, um, one of the pastors at the church I was attending at the time gave a sermon on homosexuality. And in his sermon, he basically alluded that men who struggle with same-sex attraction or SSA um, are really just lacking connection with other men 
um, and really just have a deep desire for male companionship, kind of like a, a buddy bro type situation. And I was a loner in high school. I didn't have a lot of friends. I was on some sports teams, but I didn't have that best friend that I could talk to. So what he said made sense to me. And after service was over, I went up to him and I confided in him that I was struggling with same sex attraction. Um, and I started meeting with him and another pastor on a weekly basis. And in their attempt to cure me, they proceeded to put me through conversion therapy. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't remember a lot of what they did to me. I remember bits and pieces here and there that are still very vivid in my head. I remember some stupid conference, I think it was called Exodus or something like that, that prided itself on being able to deliver people from their same sex attraction. But I've compartmentalized a lot of what was done to me and locked it in the back of my head just because it was a very dark whew, period of my life. And even though I don't remember everything, the effects of what I experienced through conversion therapy have had a very profound impact on my life to this day. I struggle with confidence, self-acceptance, have a lot of anger, sometimes self-worth. I have major trust issues. I won't let anyone get close to me and keep everyone at arm's distance. And I think the thing that I struggle with the most about having gone through conversion therapy is that um, I blame myself. No one forced me to do conversion therapy. My parents don't even know that it happened to me. In fact, my parents were actually really accepting and supportive of me when I came out. I'm the most awesome parents, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I was part of an institution that conditioned me to believe that there was something wrong with me and that I needed to be fixed. So in believing that, I did what I thought was right at the time. But I was only 17 years old. <laughs> and when you're 17, you're still going through puberty. You're experiencing all these different feelings and emotions for the first time. It sounds really naive, but I, I didn't realize what was happening as it was happening to me. So I put myself at fault because I was the one that sought help and that felt like I needed to be fixed believing in what I believed in and what was taught to me at a very vulnerable time in my life. And even though I still blame myself, there's a little part of me that says, Charlie, you were only 17. Like, you may have put yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, but they did that to you. You confided in these adults that you trusted in, and they are the ones that made you believe that you weren't worthy of love and you shouldn't have been accepted. So I just wish that I could kind of go back and give my 17-year-old self a hug and tell him that it's all bullshit, <laughs> that there's nothing wrong with him, that he's perfect the way he is. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I also want to ask, too, if it's okay, but what do you think it would take to fully forgive yourself? I think I just did. Hmm. If you can directly relate to the secret, you can step forward on three. One, two, three. All right, you may turn around. I'm actually really glad no one stepped up because <laughs> I wouldn't want anyone to go through what I went through. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Charlie. <laughs> My dog the love. <laughs> I developed an eating disorder to cope with my queerness. I developed anorexia and exercise bulimia, which if you don't know what that is, basically that is ridding the body of calories through excessive exercise. Um, it was terrible. It was awful. I would work out when I would, when I was sick, I would work out after school and sob my eyes out and go through my workouts that way. I would starve myself. And I knew from a very young age that I had feelings towards women. Um, 
But I grew up going to church and I was told that um, God can hear my thoughts and being gay is a sin. And so I felt that if I talked to anybody about how I was feeling, then it was real. Like my feelings towards the same sex was real. Um, and so I took out my confusion and also, I guess, anger on myself. And I also used being really skinny as a way to hide because I just didn't understand what was going on and how to deal with how I was feeling about myself and also my uh, home situation. So, yeah, I developed an eating disorder. Well, I'm in recovery now. I've been in recovery for years now. And... Um, I love myself. I love my body. I think I'm hot. <laughs> I, I'm really happy with how I am today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I have confidence today, which I didn't think I would ever have because I genuinely hated myself when I was sick. I'm able to have better connections. I'm able to explore myself better because the light is back in my eyes. So I'm able to show up as me authentically versus... I mean, it's like night and day who I used to be. I used to be like a shell of a person. So um, that's what keeps me going and keeps me staying healthy for sure. I just want to ask, like, who or what do you feel like you had to leave behind to be where you're at today? I'm no longer religious. So I had to fire that God that I grew up with because that God was very judgmental, dominating, unforgiving. And then ultimately finding a queer community, you know. And shocker, there are queer people who also have eating disorders. So you can find a lot of people to relate to. And, and that's what I did. I found community. You know, one in 10 people struggle with an eating disorder. So throw a rock. Someone has one. I think it's a really common and actually normalized thing in society is disordered eating, especially in L.A. If you feel like your eating disorder is helping you hide, it absolutely is not. Because everyone knew I was struggling. And I was really miserable and really hated myself and so if this helps someone who's struggling queer with an eating disorder um you're not alone i feel like that's a lot <laughs> it's like a tsunami <laughs> hey hello for me it was binge eating um, I was thin, I was thinner, literally thinner, and I went through a lot of self-punishment, a lot of uh, self-doubt, and I wanted to be thicker. I wanted to have breasts, I wanted to have curves. There was a saying that, oh, potatoes grow your butt or something like that. I don't know. So I started, I started <laughs> binge eating so I can get the right curves, mm -hmm. and it kind of like led me into like binge eating for everything else, and now, you know, I have the consequences of like having to cut down on food because I'm so used to like having two bacon double quarter pounders and large fries. When I was binge eating, the things I was doing, just any time I felt any sort of emotion, oh, I'm happy, I need to go have something to eat to celebrate. Oh, I'm sad, well, I look this way, whatever, I might as well just put more food in my body, ruin myself further, because there's no point. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, especially with being trans, um, while I don't think I ever really developed anything involving skinniness, I knew when I'd look at myself and I'd see how big I was, I hated it. I mean, look at everyone here. We don't all have the same body type. Mm -hmm. Not everyone with an eating disorder has, the, has to be skinny and thin. Like, I struggled with bulimia and I am almost, I want to say, four months clean. Wow. I'm in recovery as well. So um, I just wanted to you know, commend you that you're putting yourself in that environment that I still have to do. And I think it's very strong and very brave of you to do that. So, yeah. I feel like this is a topic that isn't discussed enough about amongst men. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a big stigma even within the gay community of what the ideal body type is. And I struggle hardcore with that. Everyone in LA has to look muscular. And if you're, you know, if you don't meet these standards, you're not attractive enough. I don't know. It's yeah. just something that needs to be talked about more. Totally. Agreed. Agreed. I'm sure you can relate as a trans woman, that even the trans community very much has a lot of weight competing. Mm. Um, there is, at least I've seen, a somewhat divide between some of the bigger girls and some of the 
much thinner ones because a lot of trans girls do develop eating disorders to try to have that smaller, more feminine figure. I love the analogy of like your foot grows, you don't put it back in the small shoe, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You get a new shoe. And that's what I have to like keep telling myself, right? You're a plant. And if your plant roots like go out of the pot, you repot it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's good. We're all stunning. (laughs) Just letting you guys know. Like we're all stunning. Yeah. Stunning. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. (laughs) Thank you guys. I was sexually assaulted and don't know how to talk about it with my family and friends. I am currently 27 years old and I was raped when I was 24, a grown adult. It's not as common for adults to talk about things like this. It's, um, it's not as, I keep using the word common, but it resonates with everything. It's like, you don't expect this as a grown adult. We tend to surround ourselves with friends and family. Back in 2019, I tagged along with my friend and he took me to another friend's house. We were just supposed to have some drinks, you know, just chill, like regular 20 year old or whatever. I think it was four hours into the night and I completely blacked out. The next morning, the next morning, I didn't know what was going on. I thought I probably ate something wrong. I was bleeding a lot. And I didn't talk to anyone about it. A month later, I ended up having a conversation with one of my uh, friends, and they shared their story about their essay, and it clicked to me. I was raped as an adult. Um, It was a really traumatic experience. It took me down a really bad rabbit hole. I couldn't trust people. I couldn't trust myself around other people. Um, it's just one of those things you don't expect to happen. I've talked to professional people, but it's not the same as having a conversation with your friends, the people that love you, uh, your family, the people that love you. And I felt like today was the perfect time to come out here because I know I'm not alone. I know there's people scared or ashamed. I was dehumanized. I think that's the right word to use. I was stripped down from my values, from my dignity, because somebody decided that I was an easy target. My friend decided I was an easy target. I know I'm not the only one, and I feel like speaking about it is the best way to at least bring some awareness to to the people that are going through things like this. I don't I don't see it as shameful. I don't see it as my mistake. That was not my fault. This was not my problem. That person decided to do what they wanted to do. And all I can do is live with it. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> If you can relate to the secret, you can step forward on three. One, two, three. Hi, Mama. 
give me the hug? I don't think anyone. Okay. I don't think anyone has to go through this, and I feel very. I feel bad because we're all amazing people with our own experiences, and I I don't think anyone has the right or the privilege to just do this to us. I relate very closely to what you said. Um, I got molested quite frequently by my um, my mom's friend, and I tried to tell her, but she freaked out even by the slight mention that something wrong was happening. So I, I guarded this. I said, okay, my family are not my allies. And obviously it took some self-discovery, self-awareness, but my advice, I guess, it's not only for the victim, but it's for the listener. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the slight clues that we're asking for help and we just have to be very aware that this is a clue for that help. Mm. I agree. Can I just say, um, I recently <laughs> have had a very similar experience where I went with a friend to another friend's house. And, um, I was drunk, blacked out. And um, my friend was there, and she didn't know. <laughs> she didn't help me. I don't know how drunk she was. But there were three guys. And um, <laughs> I still have the marks. <laughs> so I just want to commend you for sharing your story and helping me share mine. <laughs> And you were so brave, and it is none of our faults. No matter the situation, no one's. There is only the people who have hurt us to blame. I am so sorry you went through that. I want to acknowledge how far you came to get here. You know, I really want to, especially after hearing that story. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I didn't realize until telling a friend and that they're seeing their reaction basically helped me know that it was not okay what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna get into the details, but yeah, I, I really do commend you for sharing your story and coming all this way to share it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. This felt so good. And honestly, thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Group hug. Yes. <laughs> You guys are fierce. Fierce. Get it in. <laughs> I'm so proud of everyone. I signed up for therapy because my ex outed me on social media. And if this is your secret and you would like to step forward and share your story, you may do so on three. One, two, three. So yeah, so my ex did do that, and that was tough. I, especially since I worked in Christian entertainment and I had just graduated with a degree in Christian studies, I was very involved in the church. So my whole life revolved around God. So dating a girl was already very sneaky and it didn't go very well. And so she decided to post about our situation online and she would at me and put my name and the TikToks. And unfortunately, they got a lot of views and a lot of engagement. So I started having really bad panic attacks about the situation because if I were, if the wrong person were to see it, I would have lost my job. I would have lost the community I built back home. My parents didn't even know about it. So yeah, I panicked really bad. <laughs> and so I signed up for therapy as like my last desperate grab of like, what do I do? <laughs> and initially I treated therapy as like conversion therapy because I didn't see this as like this traumatic experience I needed to work through. I saw it as like a intervention of like, I need to deal with this sin right now. Otherwise I'm going to lose my job. My therapist uh, was a Christian. So she would lead me to ex-gay sources and would try to help me fight this instead of walking me through that I had like internalized homophobia. So it really wasn't until 
I met this who was an, ended up being my first love who had this really good relationship with God but also loved being gay and sh watching her just love herself truly helped me love myself and it just built this better relationship that I now have with spirituality and religion yeah and I it pulled me out of my depression I ended up reading the Bible intensely about uh, gender roles um, homosexuality and what people kept using against me. And I wrote like a hundred page paper of notes on it and I deconstructed and I was like, you know what? This isn't as solid as people are saying that it is. And now I know what it's actually saying. And so I felt a lot more comfortable to uh, put that on my past. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. If anyone can relate to the secret, you can step forward on three. One, two, three. Hey. hey, Queen. <laughs> so I stood up because I can relate to the church making you feel guilty for, you know, being queer. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to say I really admire that you educated yourself because I did not. And that's one of the biggest reasons I left because I just kept being reminded that how I felt was wrong. God could hear my thoughts. I could just really relate to people who probably also themselves don't understand the Bible, probably haven't read a lick of the Bible, probably only know John 3.16, <laughs> and go to church on Christmas and Easter, um, you know, making you feel guilty for how you feel. Oh, yeah. That's another thing that I think helped me. It was like, it's a culture thing, too, Yeah, going to church, and they are just saying something because they're part of that culture. So I just kind of remind myself that, too, whenever they're subscribing to thinking it's sinful and we're disgusting because they've grown up in this culture, so. Yeah. I even literally wore a cross today specifically yeah, yeah. because I wanted to be open about the fact that I do believe in God and that I love God. And something that I <laughs> really struck a chord with me is when you were talking about your relationship with God. You know, when my ex had first left me, I have a very close friend who's a very devout Catholic. Um, we sat and we talked and he had essentially told me the whole conversation, you're probably never gonna find love. You're probably realistically mm -hmm. never going to have that happiness that you want to as a woman. You're never gonna find a guy that you want who's gonna be able to settle down because godly people do not interact with people like you in any sort of romantic or happy manner. And all I wanted all my life was a family. I've wanted a husband. I've wanted a kid. I've wanted to kind of have that stay at home uh, wife kind of life. And hearing that from him, it is a horrible, horrible thing for your psyche. And I still very much believe in God. When I ask God, what do you like, was transitioning a bad decision? Is me being in love with men a bad decision? I don't feel that sick, gross feeling that I feel about other things. And I try to look at what blessings have come from this. Thank you guys for standing. Yeah, Religious so trauma, you know, it's right. the best. Yeah. Yeah. It's like what unites us all in some <laughs> way. Yeah. I think it's really easy to make this a political conversation and just to talk it, talk about it like it's just a bunch of talking points. So I hope sharing these like vulnerable stories makes it a more humanizing subject. Yes. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And even though we like had some like sad parts where people cried, I cried. Um, <laughs> I hope it's like seen as like a celebration of love. That's yeah. how I like wanted it to be, and I think we achieved that. Yeah. That's so nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.